The Spectacles in the Drawer by Thomas Ligotti Last year at this time, perhaps on this very day, Plum visited me at my home. He always seemed to know when I had returned from my habitual traveling and always appeared uninvited on my doorstep. Although my former residence was pathetically run down, Plum seemed to regard it as a kind of palace of wonders, and he would gaze at its high ceilings and antiquated fixtures, as if he saw some new glamour in them on each of his visits. That day, a dim one, I think, he did not fail to do the same. Then we settled into one of the spacious, though sparsely furnished rooms of my house. "'And how were your travels?' he asked, as if only in the spirit of polite conversation. I could see by his smile, an emulation of my own, no doubt, that he was glad to be back in my house and in my company. I smiled, too, and stood up. Plum, of course, stood up along with me, almost simultaneously with my own movements. "'Shall we go, then?' I said. "'What a pest,' I thought. Our footsteps tapped a moderate time on the hard wooden floor leading to the stairway. We ascended to the second floor, which I left almost entirely empty, and then up a narrow, narrower stairway to the third floor. Although I had led him along this route several times before, I could see from his wandering eyes that, for him, every crack in the walls, every cobweb fluttering in the corners above, every stale draft of the house composed a suspenseful prelude to our destination. At the end of the third floor hall there was a small wooden stairway, no more than a ladder, that led to an old storeroom where I kept certain things which I collected. It was not by any means a spacious room, and its enclosed atmosphere was thickened, as Plum would have emphasized, by its claustrophobic arrangement of tall cabinets, ceiling-high shelves, and various trunks and crates. This is simply how matters worked out over a period of time. In any case, Plum seemed to favor this state of affairs. Ah, the room of secret mystery, he said, the chamber where all your hermetical prodigies are cached away. These treasures and marvels, as Plum called them, were, I suppose, remarkable from a certain point of view. Plum loved to go through my collection of curiosities, gathering together a lapful of exotic objects and settling down on the dusty sofa at the center of the room. But it was the new items, whenever I returned from one of my protracted tours, that always took precedence in Plum's hierarchy of fascination. Thus I immediately brought out the double-handled dagger, with the single blade of polished stone. At first sight of the ceremonial object, Plum held out the flat palms of his hands, and I placed this queer device upon its rightful altar. "'Who could have made such a thing?' he asked, though rhetorically. He expected no answer to his questions, and possibly did not really desire any. And of course I offered no more elaborate an explanation than a simple smile. But how quickly I noticed on this occasion the magic of that first token of my tantalizing arcana, as he would say, lost its initial surge of attraction. How fast that glistening fog, which surrounded only Plum, dispersed to unveil a tedious clarity. I had to move faster. Here, I said, my arm searching the shadows of an open wardrobe. This should be worn when you handle that sacrificial artifact. And I threw the robe about his shoulders, engulfing his smallish frame with a cyclone of strange patterns and colors. He admired himself in the mirror attached inside the door of the wardrobe. Look at the robe in the mirror, he practically shouted. The designs are all turned around. How much stranger, how much better. While he stood there glaring at himself, I relieved him of the dagger before he had a chance to do something careless. This left his hands free to raise themselves up to the dust-caked ceiling of the room, and to the dark gods of his imagination. Gripping each handle of the dagger, I suddenly elevated it above his head, where I held it poised. In a few moments he started to giggle, and then fell into spasms of sardonic hilarity. He stumbled over to the old sofa and collapsed upon its soft cushions. I followed, but when I reached his prostrate form, it was not the pale blue blade that I brought down upon his chest. It was simply a book, one of many I had put before him. His peaked legs created a lectern, on which he rested the huge volume, propping it securely as he began turning the stiff crackling pages. The sound seemed to absorb him as much as the sight of a language he could not even name, let alone comprehend. The lost grimoire of the Abbot of Tyne, he giggled, transcribed in the language of a wild guess, I interjected. 
and a wrong one. Then the Forbidden Psalms of the Silent, the book without an author. Without an author who ever lived in this world, if you will recall what I told you about it. But you're very wide of the mark. Well, suppose you give me a hint, he said, with an impatience that surprised me. But wouldn't you prefer to speculate on its secrets, I suggested. Some moments of precarious silence passed. I suppose I would, he finally answered. Then I watched him gorge his eyes on the inscrutable script of the ancient volume. In truth, the mysteries of this sacred writ were among the most genuine of their kind, for it had never been my intention to dupe my disciple, as he justly thought of himself, with false secrets. But the secrets of such a book are not perpetual. Once they are known, they become relegated to a lesser sphere, which is that of the knower. Having lost the prestige they once enjoyed, these former secrets now function as tools in the excavation of still deeper ones which, in turn, will suffer the same corrosive fate. And this is the fate of all the secrets of the universe. Eventually the seeker of a recondite knowledge may conclude, either through insight or sheer exhaustion, that this ruthless process is never-ending, that the mortification of one mystery after another has no terminus beyond that of the seeker's own extinction. And how many still remain susceptible to the search? How many pursue it to the end of their days, with undying hope of some ultimate revelation? Better not to think in precise terms just how few the faithful are. More to the present point, it seems that Plum belonged to their infinitesimal number, and it was my intention to reduce that number by one. The plan was simple, to feed Plum's hunger for mysterious sensations to the point of nausea, and beyond. The only thing to survive would be a gut full of shame, and regret for a defunct passion. As Plum lay upon the sofa, ogling that stupid book, I moved toward a large cabinet, whose several doors were composed of a tarnished metal grillwork framed by dark wood. I opened one of these doors and exposed a number of shelves cluttered with books and odd objects. Upon one shelf, resting there as its sole occupant, was a very white box. It was no larger, as I mentally envision it, than a modest jewelry case. There were no markings on the box, except the fingerprints, or rather thumbprints, smearing its smooth white surface at its opposite, opposite edges and halfway along its length. There were no handles or embellishments of any kind, not even, at first sight, the thinnest of seams to indicate the level at which the lower part of the box met the upper part, or perhaps give away the existence of a drawer. I smiled a little at the mock intrigue of the object, then gripped it from either side, gently, and placed my thumbs precisely over the fresh, greasy prints. I applied pressure with each thumb, and a shallow drawer pop popped open at the front of the box. As hoped, Plum had been watching me as I went through these motions. "'What do you have there?' he asked. "'Patience, Plum. You will see.' I answered while delicately removing two sparkling items from the drawer. One a small and silvery knife, which very much resembled a razor-sharp letter-opener, and the other a pair of old-fashioned, wire-rimmed spectacles. Plum laid aside the now-boring book, and sat up straight against the arm of the sofa. I sat down beside him, and opened up the spectacles so that the stems were pointing toward his face. When he leaned forward, I slipped them on. "'They're only plain glass,' he said with a definite tone of disappointment or a very weak prescription. His eyes rolled about as he attempted to scrutinize what rested upon his own face. Without saying a word, I held up the little knife in front of him until he finally took notice of it. Ah, he said, smiling. There's more to it. Of course there is, I said, gently twirling the steely blade before his fascinated eyes. If you would, I need you to hold out the palm of your hand. It doesn't matter which one. Good, just like that. Don't worry, you won't even feel this. There, I said, after making a tiny cut. Now, I instructed him, keep watching that thin red trickle. Your eyes are now fused with those fantastic lenses, and your sight is one with its object. And what exactly is that object? Obviously, it is everything that fascinates, everything that has power over your gaze and your dreams. You cannot even conceive the wish to look away. And even if there are no simple images to see, nonetheless there is a vision of some kind, an infinite and overwhelming scene expanding before you. 
and the vastness of this scene is such that even the dazzling diffusion of all the known universes cannot convey these prodigies. Everything is so brilliant, so great, and so alive. Landscapes without end are rolling with a life unknown to mortal eyes, unimaginable diversity of form and motion, design and dimension, with each detail perfectly crystalline, from the mammoth shapes lurching in outline against endless horizons to the minutest cilia wriggling in an obscure oceanic niche. And even this is only a mere fragment of all that there is to see and to know. There are labyrinthine astronomies mingling together and yielding instantaneous evolutions, constant transformations of both appearance and essence. You feel yourself to be a witness to the most cryptic phenomena that exist or ever could exist. And yet, somehow concealed in the shadows of what you can see is something that is not yet visible, something that is beating like a thunderous pulse and promises still greater visions. All else is merely its membrane, enclosing the ultimate thing waiting to be born, preparing for the cataclysm, which will be both the beginning and the end. To behold the prelude to this event is an experience of unbearable anticipation, so that ecstasy and dread merge into a new emotion, one corresponding perfectly to the exposure of the ultimate source of all manifestation. The next instant, it seems, will bring with it a revolution of the total substance of things, as the seconds keep passing, the experience grows more fascinating without fulfilling its portents, without extinguishing itself in revelation. And although the visions remain active inside you, deep in your blood, you now awake. Pushing himself up from the sofa, Plum staggered forward a few steps and wiped his bloodied palm on the front of his shirt, as if to wipe away the visions he had seen. He shook his head vigorously once or twice, but the spectacles remained secure. Is everything all right? I asked him. Plum appeared to be dazzled in the worst way. Behind the spectacles, his eyes gazed dumbly, and his mouth gaped with countless unspoken words. However, when I said, Perhaps I should remove these for you, his hand rose toward mine, as if to prevent me from doing so. But his effort was half-hearted. Folding their wire stems one across the other, I replaced them back in the box. Plum now watched me as if I were performing some ritual of great moment. He seemed to be still composing himself from his experience. Well? I asked. Dreadful, he answered. But... But? What I mean is... Where did they come from? Can't you imagine that for yourself? I countered. And for a moment it seemed that in this case, too, he desired some simple answer, contrary to his most hardened habits. Then he smiled rather deviously and threw himself down upon the sofa. His eyes glazed over as he fabricated an anecdote to his fancy. "'I can see you,' he said, "'at an occultist auction in a disreputable quarter of a foreign city. The boxes carried forward, the spectacles taken out. They were made several generations ago by a man who was at once a student of the Gnostics and a master of optometry. His ambition to construct a pair of artificial eyes that would allow him to bypass the obstacle of physical appearances and glimpse a far-off realm of secret truth whose gateway is within the depths of our own blood. Remarkable, I replied. Your speculation is so close to, close to truth itself that the details are not worth mentioning for the mere sake of vulgar accuracy. In fact, the spectacles belonged to a lot of antiquarian rubbish I had once bought blindly and the box was of unknown or rather unremembered origin, just something I had lying around in my attic room, and the knife, a magician's prop, for efficiently slicing up paper money and silk ties. I carried the box containing both spectacles and knife over to Plum, holding it just beyond his reach. I said, Can you imagine the dangers involved, the possible nightmare of possessing such artificial eyes? He nodded gravely in agreement. And you can imagine the restraint the possessor of such a gruesome contrivance must practice. His eyes were all comprehension, and he was sucking a little at his slightly lacerated palm. Then nothing would please me more than to pass the ownership of this miraculous artifact on to you, my dear Plum. I'm sure you will hold it in wonder as no one else could. And it was exactly this wonder that it was my malicious aim to undermine, or rather to expand until it ripped itself apart for I could no longer endure the sight of it. 
As Plum once again stood at the door of my home, holding his precious gift with a child's awkward embrace, I could not resist asking him the question. By the way, Plum, have you ever been hypnotized? No, he said. Why do you ask? Curiosity, I replied. You know how I am. Well, good night. Then I closed the door behind the most willing subject in the world, hoping it would be some time before he returned. If ever, I said aloud, and the words echoed in the hollows of my home. 2. But it was not long afterward that Plum and I had our next confrontation, though the circumstances were accidental. Late one afternoon, as it happens, I was browsing through a shop that dealt in second-hand merchandise of the most pathetic sort. The place was positively littered with tossed-off oddments and pure trash, rusty scales that once would have given your weight for a penny, cockeyed bookcases, broken toys, old furniture, standing ashtrays late of some hotel lobby, and a hodgepodge of items that seemed entirely inscrutable in their origin and purpose. For me, however, such desolate bazaars offered more diversion and consolation than the most exotic marketplaces, which so often made good on their strange promises that mystery itself ceased to have meaning. But my second-hand seller made no promises and inspired no dreams, leaving all that to those more ambitious hucksters who trafficked in such stock in trade and I had left that search behind me, as previously explained. What the mystical rarities of this earth were for Plum, the most used-up and dismal commodities had become for me. Now I could ask no more of a given gray afternoon than to find myself in an establishment that had nothing to sell but the charm of disenchantment. By coincidence, that particular afternoon, in the second-hand shop, brought me, if only in an indirect manner, together with Plum. The visual transaction took place in a tilting mirror that stood near the shop's back wall, one of the many mirrors that seemed to con constitute a specialty of the place. I had squatted down before this relic and wiped my bare hand across its dusty surface. And there, hidden beneath the dust, was the face of Plum, who must have just entered the shop and was standing a room's length away. While he seemed to recognize immediately the reverse side of me, his expression betrayed the hope that I had not seen him. There was shock as well as shame upon that face, and something else besides. And if Plum had approached me, what could I have said to him? Perhaps I would have mentioned that he did not look very well, or that it appeared he had been the victim of an accident. But how could he explain what had happened to him except to reveal the truth that we both knew, and neither would speak? Fortunately, this scene was to remain in its hypothetical state, because a moment later he was out the door. I cautiously approached the front window of the shop in time to see Plum hurrying off into the dull, unreflecting day, his right hand held up to his face. It was only my intention to cure him, I mumbled to myself. I had not considered that he was incurable, nor that things would have developed in the way they did. 3. After that day I wondered, eventually to the point of obsession, what kind of hell had claimed poor Plum for its own? I knew only that I had provided him with a type of toy, the subliminal ability to feast his eyes on an imaginary universe in a droplet of his own blood. The possibility that he would desire to magnify this experience, or indeed that he would be capable of such a feat, had not seriously occurred to me. Obviously, however, this had become the case. I now had to ask myself how much farther Plum's situation could be extended. The answer, though I could not guess it at the time, was presented to me in a dream. And it seemed fitting that the dream had its setting in that old attic storeroom of my house, which Plum had once prized above all other rooms in the world. I was sitting in a chair, a huge and enveloping chair, which in reality does not exist, but in the dream directly faces the sofa. No thoughts or feelings troubled me, and I had only the faintest sense that someone else was in the room. But I could not see who it was, because everything appeared so dim in outline, blurry and grayish. There seemed to be some movement in the region of the sofa, as if the enormous cushions themselves had become lethargically restless. Unable to fathom the source of this movement, I touched my hand to my temple in thought. This was how I discovered that I was wearing a pair of spectacles with circular lenses connected to wiry stems. I thought to myself, if I remove these spectacles I will be able to see more clearly but a voice told me not to remove them, and I recognized that voice. Then something moved, 
a man-shaped shadow upon the sofa. A climate of dull horror began to invade my surroundings. Go away, Plum. You have nothing to show me, I said. But the voice disagreed with me in sinister whispers that made no sense yet seemed filled with meaning. I would indeed be shown things, these whispers seemed to be saying. Already I was being shown things, astonishing things, mysteries and marvels beyond anything I had ever suspected. And suddenly all my feelings, as I gazed through the spectacles, were proof of that garbled pronouncement. They were feelings of a peculiar nature which, to my knowledge, one experiences only in dreams. Sensations of infinite expansiveness and ineffable meaning that have no place elsewhere in our lives. But although these astronomical emotions suggested wonders of incredible magnitude and character, I saw nothing through those magic lenses except this, the obscure shape in the shadows before me as its outline grew clearer and clearer to my eyes. Gradually I came to view what appeared to be a mutilated carcass, something of a terrible rawness, a torn and flayed thing whose every laceration could be seen with microscopic precision. The only thing of color in my grayish surroundings, it twitched and quivered like a gory heart exposed beneath the body of the dream, and it made a sound like hellish giggling. Then it said, I am back from my trip, as if mocking me. It was this simple statement that inspired my efforts to tear the spectacles from my face, even though they now seemed to be part of my flesh. I gripped them with both hands and flung them against the wall, where they shattered. Somehow this served to exorcise my tormented companion, who faded back into the grayness. Then I looked at the wall and saw that it was running red where the spectacles had struck, and the broken lenses that lay upon the floor were bleeding. To experience such a dream as this on a single occasion might very well be the stuff of a haunting, lifelong memory, something that perhaps might even be cherished for its unfathomable depths of feeling. But to suffer over and over this same nightmare, as I soon found was my fate, leads one to seek nothing so much as a way to kill the dream, to expose all its secrets and reduce it to fragments that can be forgotten. In my search for this deliverance, I first looked to the sheltering shadows of my home, sobering shadows which at other times had granted me a cold and stagnant peace. I tried to argue myself free of my nightly excursions, to discourse these visions away, lecturing the walls contra the prodigies of a mysterious world. Since any form of existence, I muttered, since any form of existence is by definition a conflict of forces, or it is nothing at all, what can it possibly matter if these skirmishes take place in a world of marvels or one of mud? The difference between the two is not worth mentioning, or none. Such distinctions are the work of only the crudest and most limited perspectives, the sense of mystery and wonder foremost among them. Even the most esoteric ecstasy, when it comes down to it, requires the prop of vulgar pain in order to stand up as an experience. Having acknowledged the truth, however provisional, and the reality, if subject to mutation, of all that is most strange in the universe, whether known, unknown, or merely suspected, one must conclude that such marvels change nothing in our existence. The gallery of human sensations that existed in prehistory is identical to the one that faces each life today, that will continue to face each new life as it enters this world, and then looks beyond it. Thus I attempted to reason my way back to self-possession, but no measure of my former serenity was forthcoming. On the contrary, my days as well as my nights were now poisoned by an obsession with plum. Why had I given him those spectacles? More to the point, why did I allow him to retain them? It was time to take back my gift, to confiscate those little bits of glass and twisted metal that were now har harrowing the wrong mind. And since I had succeeded too well in keeping him away from my door, I would have to be the one to approach his. 4. But it was not Plum who answered the rotting door of that house which stood at the street's end, and beside a broad expanse of empty field. It was not Plum who asked if I was a newspaper journalist or a policeman before closing that gouged and filthy door in my face, when I replied that I was neither of those. Pounding on the door, which seemed about to crumble under my fist, I summoned the sunken-eyed man a second time to ask if this was in fact Mr. Plum's address. I had never visited him at his home, that hopeless little box in which he lived and slept and dreamed. Was he a relative? 
No, I answered. Then what? You're not here to collect a bill, because if that's the case... For the sake of simplicity, I interjected that I was a friend of Mr. Plum. Then how is it you don't know? For the sake of my curiosity, I said that I had been away on a trip, as I often was, and had my own reasons for notifying Mr. Plum of my return. Then you don't know anything, he stated flatly. Exactly, I replied. It was even in the newspaper, and they asked me about him. Plum, I confirmed. That's right, he said, as if he had suddenly become the custodian of a secret knowledge. Then he waved me into the house and led me through its ugly airless interior to a small storage room at the back. He reached along the wall inside the room, as if he wanted to avoid entering it, and switched on the light. Immediately I understood why the hollow-faced man preferred not to go into that room, for Plum had renovated this space in a very strange way. Each wall, as well as the ceiling and floor, was a mosaic of mirrors, a shocking galaxy of redundant reflections. And each mirror was splattered across its surface, as if someone had swung brushfuls of paint from various points throughout the room, spreading dark stars across a silvery firmament. In his attempt to exhaust or exaggerate the visions to which he had apparently become enslaved, Plum had done nothing less than multiplied these visions into infinity, creating oceans of his own blood, and enabling himself to see with countless eyes. Entranced by such aspiration, I gazed at the mirrors in speechless wonder. Among them was that tilting mirror I remembered looking into not so long ago. The landlord, who did not follow me into the room, said something about suicide and a body ripped raw. This news was, of course, unnecessary, as I stood overwhelmed at Plum's ingenuity. It was some time before I could look away from that gallery of glass and gore. Only afterward did I fully realize that I would never be rid of the horrible Plum. He had broken through all the mirrors, projected himself into the eternity beyond them. And even when I abandoned my home, with its hideous attic storeroom, Plum still followed me in my dreams. He now travels with me to the ends of the earth, initiating me night after night into his unspeakable wonders. I can only hope that we will not meet in another place, one where the mysteries are always new and dreams never end. Oh, Plum, will you not stay in that box where they have put your self-riven body?'